So here's a question. Does anybody own Mars? I don't mean that in some crystal-gripping, can-you-ever-own-the-wind kind of way. I mean as property. Does it belong to everyone, or is it ripe to be claimed? If so, are we going back to colonial rules with flag planting and declarations? Or are we going back even further, and Mars will belong to the first person to lick it, pee on it, or stomp their size tens into the Martian dust? You know, whichever odor and or fluid-based dibs claiming system you prefer. But what if it's not China, Russia, the US, Paraguay, or any other country that gets there first? What if it's a private company, or even a solo billionaire off his nut? There's a very real possibility that in the next five years, we'll all be watching a live stream of one small step for Elon, one giant leap for Musk kind. And if the owner of SpaceX wants to add another E and M to his initials, could anybody stop him? Way back in the day, to get European countries to stop murdering each other over who owned what land, they developed a couple of legal concepts. The law of discovery and the idea of terra nullius, nobody's land, basically said, look, if you want more territory, the only legitimate way to do it is to find land that doesn't already belong to anybody. Finders keepers, plant your flag and it's yours. A few centuries of flag planting later, a few problems with this doctrine had become apparent. This didn't really reduce global conflict. For one, European countries kept fighting each other anyway, and now they also spent a lot of their time trying to convince the nobody that lived in these places that their land was unclaimed. In kind of the same way a carjacker will try to convince you that you're driving an abandoned vehicle. In the aftermath of World War II, dozens of former colonies were declaring their independence and throwing off colonial rule. So many, actually, that fully 26% of all the current countries in the world were founded or gained their independence between 1951 and 1968. The reason for this little history lesson is because it sets the stage for 1967, a year when two superpowers were competing to set foot on land that really was empty and unclaimed. All those tiny problems with the flag planting system were on everybody's mind, especially since this time the would-be flag planters had nukes. Just to make sure nobody seized the high ground that was the moon, the international community passed the Outer Space Treaty, or if you want its full name, the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies. Which sounds pretty thorough, but just like Thomas Paine somehow forgot to mention broadband internet access when he wrote his Treatise on the Rights of Man, the top gaseous cub failed to account for private industry operating a space program. To be fair to them, there was kind of a lot going on. If 2020 could be compared to a decade, it would be the 1960s. Sure, there's a lot of movies with colorful hippies, slick spies, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all that looks like a pretty good time. But unless you were a suburban white kid in the United States, it really wasn't. And even if you were, you still might get drafted to fight the commies in the next couple years, or nuked into glow-in-the-dark pixie dust by the commies in the next 10 minutes. So when everyone got together to draft a space treaty, they really weren't concerned with whether or not GM might someday build a rover plant on Mars, they just wanted to keep nukes off the moon. At the time, nobody knew who would eventually win the space race, so it seemed prudent to everyone to limit the spoils that might go to that eventual victor. So the overwhelming majority of Earth's nations banned any country from snatching new territory or even owning territory in space. Which is why Neil Armstrong's giant leap was for all mankind even though the U.S. couldn't resist waggling its flag in the face of the USSR. But that was more for the sake of tradition than claiming the moon as American territory. So if no country can own anything in space, how does private industry fit into all this? Let me put it like this. If you're duping around here on Earth, hiking by a stream, and you happen to find a gold nugget, it's probably your lucky day. But it might not be. Depending on where you are, who you tell, how you found it, and whether or not you own the land or mineral rights to that land, you might not get to keep your shiny new rock. In space, we know where the gold nuggets are, but if you went out to go get one, is it yours? If you bring it back to Earth, can you sell it, or do you have to share it with everyone? Because technically, it belongs to no one, or, or maybe everyone. And if countries can't own things in space, but corporations can, really, how close are we to that Blade Runner-esque future dominated by megacorporations? Right now, if you're in a conversation and you want to emphasize the complexity of a problem by comparing it to somebody's job, you've really got two options. Rocket science and brain surgery. But I think I found a third one. Space law. 
I hope that saying that in my best Monster Truck Sunday voice will add some interest, because as impressive as the job of space lawyer might sound, going over the finer points of international treaties and aerospace law doesn't exactly make for compelling viewing. So here's the bare bones version of what happened since the Outer Space Treaty was adopted in 1967. For one, we're no longer on constant brown alert for nuclear war, which is a great development. Also, world superpowers aren't the only organizations dinking around in space, which is good, I think. And these new celestial competitors don't answer to voters, parliament, or really any government of any country, not directly anyway. They're run by their CEO, who may be answers to the company's board of directors, shareholders, or possibly just their own reflection in a mirror. That development is, um, as I said in a previous video, back when I was apparently still learning how to use my lapel mic and to cut my own hair, technology has advanced to the point where now anyone can own their own space program. At least if you have a spare billion dollars or two laying around. In that same episode, I mentioned one of the very first commercial space companies, Planetary Resources, a well-funded, pioneering company bent on mining asteroids, which also completely collapsed in late 2019. The nine-figure failure of Planetary Resources wasn't a total loss. At the very least, it gave us a couple things. A damn good opportunity to laugh at an insurance company, and some legislation that changed the landscape of space commerce. Some of the company's $100 million war chest went to lobbyists, and PR's PR managed to get the United States to pass the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015. This allows private companies to own any resources that they collect out in space. That question is still a huge gray area in terms of international law, but several other countries have since come around to the idea that private industry has a role to play here, especially since the nations themselves can't. Currently, the United States, China, Luxembourg, Japan, and a few others are planning their own asteroid mining programs. Luxembourg? Quick rapid-fire tangent for anyone who's never really heard of Luxembourg. It's a tiny European country located between Germany and France. Politically, they're the world's only grand duchy. You spell their name Luxembourg. The country is roughly the size of Rhode Island, has the population of Milwaukee, one of their official languages is Lumbergish and they have a national holiday to mark the birthday of their Grand Duchess, which was held on the 23rd of January, because that was her birthday, but then everyone decided that they'd much rather have a day off in the summer, so they moved her birthday to the 23rd of June. There you go. Starting in 2016, Luxembourg also set its sights on becoming the global leader of commercial space mining. They offered a $200 million investment fund and generous financial incentives, hoping to attract enough space companies to make their tiny country a hub of celestial resource extraction. Sort of like Nevada is for brothels and Ireland is for tax evasion. Exploiting extraterrestrial resources while based in a grand duchy seems about as incongruent as Princess Bride Star Trek crossover fanfiction, but so far more than 60 companies have relocated to or been founded in Luxembourg. So, Captain Wesley it is. For the few countries that have passed them, most of these new space mining laws are pretty similar. They say that companies based there can own the resources they collect, and they make the parent nation responsible for that company. Sort of like how it works for ships on the high seas. Think of it like this. If you're more than a few hundred miles away from land, you're probably not in any country's territory. You're in what's known as a global commons, an area that belongs to everybody. Which is not to say that you can't go fishing. Your standard McFish sandwich contains a bunch of stuff, but at least some of what's in there is Pollock, a small species of fish that's not large enough or fancy enough to have a name you probably will recognize, even though you've also eaten it a few hundred times. At least if you're like me and grew up in a middle class or below household. There's a decent chance that the fish in your sandwich was caught outside of America's territorial waters, waters which don't belong to McDonald's either. So what gives? How can they charge you for something snatched from a place that belongs to everybody? Well. Ships operate under a country's flag, and without going too far into it, kind of act like little floating blobs of that country's territory. Flying a country's flag is essentially saying, hey, we follow this country's laws, obey all the treaties that they do, and they have our backs too. So whatever country's flag flew over the ship that caught your Pollock is the country that recognizes that ship's claim to whatever it catches, and the country that vouches for them on the world stage. The rest of the world more or less agrees about all of this, and whoever owns that ship is now free to sell that Pollock to McDonald's, who then sells it to you. And in a nutshell, that's basically what some countries want to do with space. Luxembourg is saying, look, 
slap our flag on the side of your company's space shuttle, and we'll recognize your ownership of whatever you bring back from the great beyond. But even the corporate utopia that is the United States doesn't allow corporations to own real estate in space, just the resources extracted from it. Which means even though we've explained pretty much everything you need to know for asteroid mining, there's still one gigantic looming question left unanswered. That is, what the hell is this guy up to? Astute beta users of SpaceX's Starlink internet service noticed a puzzling little clause in the terms of service that every user has to sign. It states, the parties recognize Mars as a free planet and that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Martian activities. Accordingly, disputes will be settled through self-governing principles established in good faith at the time of Martian settlement. <coughs> uh, so is Mars up for grabs to whoever gets there first? Well. No, but also maybe. First off, let's deal with the no. SpaceX is based and organized in the United States. So effectively, they're sailing under a United States flag, to use the analogy from earlier. This means the United States is kind of responsible for their actions. If SpaceX accidentally dropped a sack of Mars rocks onto a fishing village in the middle of the Pacific, US taxpayers will pick up the bill for anything the company's insurance doesn't cover. No, really. If SpaceX someday decides that Mars is independent, then the US will have to either get them to knock it off or defend them on the world stage. Also, the vast majority of countries around the world still consider everything else in our solar system to be community property. They're saying it's not that no one owns it, everyone owns it. So running out there and claiming anything would be like you trying to build your house in a city park. But as I mentioned, the United States does not take that view, which brings us to the maybe. 12 years after the Outer Space Treaty, the world took a crack at a new treaty that better addressed who could lay claim to all the stuff in outer space. It was called the Moon Agreement, because it mostly concerned the Moon, but also the same rules would apply everywhere else. After it was drafted, it was promptly ignored by every country with a space program. 41 years later, the only spacefaring country to sign it is India. Also, they haven't ratified it, so whatever. Not only did the United States not sign the Moon Treaty, an executive order from April of 2020 explicitly states that the United States opposes the Moon Treaty and does not consider space to be a global commons. Which means the country responsible for SpaceX's behavior also considers space to be, if not up for grabs, at least up for discussion. For what it's worth, the agency responsible for regulating SpaceX in the United States is the FCC. You know, that bastion of corporate oversight and transparency. Finally, as favorable as the United States might be toward corporate shenanigans, it only has power over SpaceX if SpaceX remains a US corporation. Doesn't have to. The reality of the situation is that right now, SpaceX and other corporations have to play nice with international laws, if for no other reason than those countries pay their bills and store their money. In short, the companies need the countries more than the countries need the companies. Which means it'll probably be some time before there's any danger of the world's richest man renaming Mars to Jeff with its moons Preston and Bezos. But as we've seen, the situation with all of this stuff moved pretty quickly. So that could change. Known simply as The Company, the Wayland yutani Corporation's slogan is Building Better Worlds. It's the sci-fi megacorporation from the Aliens universe that owns pretty much everything. They own the colonies off Earth, the ships that take you to those colonies, and the governments that decide who gets to go. It used to be a lot easier to dismiss that universe as a far-fetched sci-fi fever dream, except there's actually one historical example of a corporation that comes close to what we're talking about here, the East India Company. At its height, the East India Company was worth about $8 trillion in today's money. That's basically Amazon and Apple combined times four. They had a standing army twice the size of Britain's paltry 100,000-man force, they controlled half of India, and they lasted about 30 years longer than the United States has currently been a country. They controlled a large part of the resources and transportation for trade in the British Empire. I'm sure you can see the parallels here. It isn't too hard to imagine a path from where we are today to having a Wayland yutani in the next 50 years. Right now, the most advanced space program on Earth is run by a privately held corporation. Corporations have the most freedom to exploit the resources they find out in space. And whether or not that ownership extends beyond those resources to the land they're extracted from is at best a legal gray area. One thing is certain though, Elon Musk thinks it does. It's not just that clause of the Starlink user agreement. SpaceX's plans for Mars City 
are not the kind of thing you build on rental property. And making sure your spaceships can take off from and land on ships in international waters is exactly the kind of thing you would do if you don't want to answer to any other country's small-minded, Earth-centric laws. Whether or not your country is a superpower in the future might depend on whether or not it has a commercial space program. It'll be at least a decade or two before anything in space is at all self-sustaining. But it's looking more and more like SpaceX plans for Mars City to be nothing less than the most ambitious corporate headquarters in history. While the legal standing of countries in space means that by definition, Musk can't convert his corporate HQ into the capital of the very first extraterrestrial nation, he might not have to. Humanity's future in space could very easily become a competition between those companies that are just thin fronts for their home country to act by proxy, and those companies that gain enough control to operate a country as the face of their business back home. The basic reality of who controls access to the nearly infinite resources of our solar system could effectively eliminate any practical difference between the two.